Aloha champions and welcome back to this Friday science video. We're halfway through unit four of science and yes, I know I'm moving through it relatively quickly. We'll come back to geology and all the wonderful sciences involved in tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcanoes. But I do wanna to try to get as much of this unit done before winter break as possible. So we're on lesson 4.4 .4 out of seven, I believe. So we've got three more videos for next week that we'll, we'll be watching all about how the world is changing beneath our feet. So in our last video, we talked about earthquakes, earthquakes, which are rare, not unheard of here in Arizona. Now we're moving on to something that here in Arizona, we will never have to worry about not any time in our lifetime until we get a coastline when California breaks up by moving further north into Alaska, but that's thousands and millions of years away. We're talking about tsunamis, giant waves of water that crash into um, land and wipe out buildings and so forth. So three things uh, my eyes are immediately drawn to before I begin on this chapter. We have our big question. Our big question is how can communities better protect themselves from tsunamis? So coastal communities, towns, villages, cities, anything that lives on the coast, how can it better protect itself from being wiped out by giant tsunami waves? Our vocabulary term is tsunami, and I'll say it over and over again, is a wave, a series, or waves caused by displaced water. So that's a very vague one. We've got waves, but then we've got tsunamis, giant, giant waves or large waves, okay? A word to know based off of our vocabulary term of displaced water is to displace. To displace something means to move into its space and push it out of position. And we'll get a little more diagrams of how that water is being displaced. But without further ado, let's get into chapter four, all about tsunamis. A fishing boat heads into the Indian Ocean. The captain listens to a report on the radio. A powerful earthquake, magnitude 9.0, has been detected in Indonesia. The captain thinks, that's a very strong earthquake, but it's thousands of miles away from here. But two hours later, he feels his boat rise. An unusually broad wave has just passed beneath the boat. He watches the wave grow taller as it approaches shore. It becomes a wall of water that crashes onto the shore, flooding the nearest town. The captain has witnessed a tsunami. A wave or series of waves produced by a large displacement of water. This means water was forced out of its place. Displacement can be caused by the seafloor lifting up or dropping down, and earthquakes can cause tsunamis too. So tsunamis are a result of earthquakes or the earth bubbling up or bubbling down and making a gap where water needs to be. So here we have our regular sea level. If the earth moves or we have an earthquake, it's gonna send vibration waves through the water. And as it gets closer and closer to the shore, the shore, the crust underneath the water gets shallower and shallower. Those waves get bigger and bigger until they're taller than the lighthouse, okay? The size and scale of tsunamis. Tsunamis can cause damage and change Earth's surface over a very wide area. This, this is because a tsunami can travel thousands of miles and spread across an entire ocean. This is what happened back in 2004. The tsunami began just off the coast of Sumatra, a large island in Indonesia. It happened when an earthquake caused a huge area of the seafloor to rise up by several meters. So three or four times my height is the earth. And we said the earth is a heavy thing compared to us. It just suddenly rose up, okay? S displacing all the ocean water above it. The tsunami waves struck Indonesia first. 
and then nearby nations such as Thailand and Sri Lanka. Hours later, the waves reached the coast of Africa and Australia, parting in different ways. Waves continued to travel, reflect, and bounce around the Indian Ocean and beyond for more than a full day. In the open ocean, the tsunami was only about half a meter high, so it's short. It's like here, but that's in the ocean with hundreds of feet of ocean beneath it. When that uh, sea level, the base of the sea, gets higher, the water gets taller, okay? It was very broad and it was very fast, about as fast as a jet airliner over 700, 800 miles per hour. Near the shore, the tsunami slowed and grew to heights of about 100 feet. 100 feet, taller than most skyscrapers that we have here in Phoenix. Here we have the coastline of a city and here is afterwards when all that water from those giant waves crashes down. You see that it stretches almost all the way to this major highway. We've got this major highway here, and the water erases all of those buildings or those homes, those markets, the communities where people live. Okay? Tsunami history. The term tsunami is Japanese for a harbor wave. Japan has had many tsunamis because it is close to where several of Earth's plates meet. Remember those moving plates? Well, when those plates move, it causes earthquakes, and earthquakes can cause tsunamis. Part of that ring of fire that I talked briefly about in our last video. This is where the majority of tsunamis occur. Japan has records of large waves that struck coastal areas dating back more than 1,500 years. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's something they would known about for thousands of years. Tsunamis were common enough that people took the time to carve warnings into stone tablets and plant them as markers on coastal hillsides. This suggests that earthquakes and tsunamis occur somewhat regularly and should be expected in areas that have experienced them before. Today, countries with coastal areas vulnerable to tsunamis use special buoys in the ocean to detect the rise and fall of water waves. These warn scientists when a potential tsunami is headed to shore. These devices are called tsunometers. Tsunami warnings may also be issued when an earthquake strikes. So here's our surface buoy that pings off of our satellite, sends all those waves up to the satellite, back to our warning center, and it's measuring the tsunaminator down at the bottom. And if this detects movement, it will ping the buoy, which will ping the satellite, which will ping the warning center to say, hey, we need to get to higher ground fast. Tsunometers measure tsunamis. But you can also use a seismograph, which measures seismic waves, which are the result of earthquakes. And earthquakes can cause tsunamis. Okay, so you can use a tsunometer under the water or a seismograph on land to measure an earthquake. And if you're anywhere near the water, you might know that, hey, that might displace some of that water and we should move to higher ground. The effects of a tsunami. Tsunamis can cause damage both directly and indirectly. The wall of water that rushes onto shore can harm animals, topple trees and buildings and cause extensive damage to the land. The flood of salt water can spoil the soil and kill all the plants. A tsunami can also damage facilities or structures that people depend on. This is how tsunamis inflict terrible damage, including beyond the loss of life. The electricity that Fukushima used was generated by a nuclear power plant. The electricity that kept the reactors going was generated downhill from the plant near the water. When the March 11, 2011 earthquake struck and caused a tsunami, a wave as tall as a five-story building destroyed the backup generators that helped keep the reactors cool. Workers tried other ways of cooling the reactors, but within several days, the reactors suffered meltdowns. They exploded and released dangerous radiation into the environment. 
This caused extensive damage to the area that made it unsafe for people to go near the plant afterward. Here we have a photo of uh, taken from a U.S. Navy helicopter that shows an entire home floating out in the sea after the 2011 tsunami that struck Japan. Debris was drawn out to sea as the waves receded. Some debris drifted all the way to California and Oregon. Thousands of miles away is debris from Japan struck by the tsunami floating all the way over across the Pacific Ocean to land in Oregon. Okay, so tsunamis are dangerous. They're deadly. Um, if you think back to when we talked in chapter 12 of Sylvia Aki about the atomic bomb, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima took the lives of 40,000 people. The atomic bomb of, on Nagasaki took the lives of 60,000 people. There are tsunamis on records that in a single day have taken the lives of 200,000 plus people huge devastating losses can happen from these giant waves okay but we can be prepared so we want to work on plans of how to be prepared for our tsunamis what can communities do to be better prepared for those tsunamis communities build seawalls and have warning systems to help them prepare seawalls can absorb some of the force of the tsunami waves these can also help prevent the flood from overwhelming the shore. But the 2011 tsunami showed that the seawall can only do so much unless they are high enough and strong enough to block the flood. Communities can avoid some harm by not building too much in areas most vulnerable to tsunamis. Leaving natural barriers in place can reduce some of the impact of a tsunami. Coastal wetlands can act as a buffer that absorbs some of that force of the waves and slows the flood. Mangrove forests such as this in areas affected by the 2004 tsunami suffered less damage than nearby areas that had lost all of their mangroves. Mangroves and wetland grasses can also hold on to sediment and soil better than an exposed beach or developed shoreline. So as pretty as going to the beach is, if you're taking away natural mangrove trees that grow in areas where you have high waters from the ocean, you probably don't want to get rid of those or else you might have more damage happen from a tsunami. Okay. Tsunometers, those devices that measure tsunamis, are anchored at different points in the ocean. They are part of a network that helps coastal areas receive warnings of tsunamis. The map shows where tsunometers are located. If a large wave passes under a tsunometer, the wave's height is measured and sent via satellite signal to the network of scientists that record these data. A tsunami warning can be automatically sent out, giving people who live at or near sea level some time to flee to higher ground. Boat captains who may be in shallow water can also receive the warning and head out to the deeper waters where the waves won't be so high, where the tsunami will not be as tall or as dangerous. Tsunami warnings can also be triggered by earthquakes alone because earthquakes are so often the first step in producing a tsunami. So here we have all the tsunometers, again, located here in the Ring of Fire that includes Japan, California, Alaska, and Russia but also parts of India and in the East Coast and the Atlantic. More likely to happen in the Pacific, but not unheard of anywhere where you have ocean uh, that can be displaced. So thinking of our tsunometers, our seismometers, those are ways in which people can protect themselves, early warning systems. We also want to build up strong defensive walls in the sea that can take that force. We also want to leave the sea as it is. As much as people want to be near the sea, if there's naturally occurring resources there, maybe we can just leave those there and it will help prevent future loss. But tsunamis are a big unpredictable factor that could damage a lot of buildings and take a lot of lives. So as future scientists and geologists, 
Maybe this is a field of study that you want to go into to create new and better ways to protect people from these natural disaster of the earth changing and uh, shifting over time. So I thank you for your time. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. You've got five to 10 questions to answer in Google Classroom, and I hope you stay awesome, and I will talk to you real soon.